Topic 1. Current Challenge to Faith Let me begin by thanking you for being willing to reflect with me on this scandal. It is the greatest crisis that the Catholic Church has faced in the last 500 years. I encourage you to use the study guide for this series. It gives the outlines for the 12 topics, three study questions for each topic, a bibliography of resources. I have a lifelong interest in church history, and for that reason, throughout this series, I will use a number of examples from church history. In May of 2010, Pope Benedict XVI made a pastoral visit to Portugal. He was questioned about the media coverage of clergy sex abuse of minors and young people. And the Pope responded that the sins of the Church's members are a bigger threat to its mission than any persecution from outside. Now, the media coverage of this crisis is not automatically persecution, no matter what the motivation of some journalist may have been. When you tell the truth, you tell the truth. Journalists did not create the abuse. Reporting on it is something that they owe their reading publics. Considering that the persecutions that the Church has endured over 20 centuries, Pope Benedict XVI's statement is a remarkable one, but clearly a very true one. The U.S. bishops in June of 2002 opened their document, Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People, by writing, the Church in the United States is experiencing a crisis without precedent in our time. The Greek word scandalon, from which we get the English scandal, means an obstacle or a stumbling block, often something intentionally placed in front of someone else. The clergy sex abuse crisis especially since it has become more public in the United States in January of 2002, has shaken the faith of many people in the Church. In Dallas, in June of 2002, on June 13th, the president of the Bishops' Conference, Wilton Gregory, then the Bishop of Belleville, Illinois, now the Archbishop of Atlanta, spoke to the assembled bishops and to the many media representatives who were present there. And he said, My brother bishops, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the Catholic Church in the United States is in a very grave crisis, perhaps the gravest we have faced. The crisis is not about a lack of faith in God, in fact, those Catholics who live their faith actively day by day will tell you that their faith in God is not in jeopardy. It has indeed been tested by this crisis, but it is very much intact. The crisis, in truth, is about a profound loss of confidence by the faithful in our leadership as shepherds. Because of our failures in addressing the crime of the sexual abuse of children and young people, by priests and church personnel. What we are facing is not a breakdown in belief, but a rupture in our relationship as bishops with the faithful. And this breakdown is understandable. We did not go far enough to ensure that every child and minor was safe from sexual abuse. Rightfully, the faithful are questioning why we failed to take the necessary steps. The unity for which the Lord prayed fervently for his disciples and his church on the night before he died. A unity that sadly has been broken too often in our history as a church. Is in serious danger of being fractured again. 
this time within our beloved Church in the United States. These are times that cry out for a genuine reconciliation within the Church in our country. Not a reconciliation that merely binds a wound so that we can move forward together in some hobbled kind of fashion. What we need is a reconciliation that heals, one that brings us together to address this issue in a way that ensures that it will not happen again, one that begins with a love of the truth that is Jesus Christ, one that embraces fully and honestly the authentic elements of the sacrament of penance as we celebrate it in the Catholic tradition. Only by truthful confession, heartfelt contrition, and firm purpose of amendment can we hope to receive the generous mercy of God and the forgiveness of our brothers and sisters. The penance that is necessary here is not the obligation of the Church at large in the United States, but the responsibility of the bishops ourselves, both what we have done and what we have failed to do, contributed to the sexual abuse of children and young people by clergy and church personnel. Moreover, our God-given duty as shepherds of the Lord's people holds us responsible and accountable to God and to the church for the spiritual and moral health of all of God's children, especially those who are weak and most vulnerable. It is we who need to confess, and so we do. We are the ones, whether through ignorance or lack of vigilance, or, God forbid, with knowledge, who allowed priest abusers to remain in ministry and reassign them to communities where they continued to abuse. We are the ones who chose not to report the criminal actions of priests to the authorities because the law did not require this. We are the ones who worried more about the possibility of scandal than in bringing about the kind of openness that helps prevent abuse. And we are the ones who at times responded to victims and their families as adversaries and not as suffering members of the Church. Our confession is matched by a heartfelt contrition. To the victim survivors, I want to say this. If we bishops have learned anything, it is how devastating are the effects of sexual abuse on the children and young people who suffer it. Even the passage of many years does not wipe away the memory of these terrible crimes. And so often, beyond the wounds inflicted on the memory, a priest's whole personality also shows the results of these violations of innocence. Those of us who have not experienced sexual abuse in our childhood can never fully understand what it has done to you. But I promise you this, we bishops will make every effort to take on your perspective, to see the world and the Church through your eyes, and to look at our own actions over the last decade from your point of view. Most importantly, in my own name and in the name of all the bishops, I express the most profound apology to each of you who have suffered sexual abuse by a priest or another official of the Church. I am deeply and will forever be sorry for the harm you have suffered. We ask your forgiveness. Now, in this talk, the bishop goes on to uh, speak to parents and families of victim survivors, uh, to faithful priests. And then he says, my brother bishops, there is a lot of anger among us in this room. Righteous anger. He concludes his talk on this occasion by saying, these have been months and years and decades of tremendous suffering and pain, especially for the victim survivors and their families, but also for so many others in the church. I renew my faith in the words of St. Paul, quote, where sin has increased, grace has far surpassed it, Romans 5.20. And I invite each of you to do the same. In Jesus Christ, there is no cross without resurrection, no death without life, no purgation without cleansing and grace. Let us embrace the grace that God gives us so abundantly so that the work we do in these days together may be to his glory and contribute to full reconciliation and healing in the church. Bishop Gregory's talk refers to a feeling among many people that the crisis 
or the scandal has begun with the actual abuse that people have experienced. But most folks are even more scandalized by the failure of bishops and religious superiors of men to respond adequately. I think Francis of Assisi can be of some help to us as we deal with this crisis or scandal. In his testament, dictated shortly before he died, Francis uses the Latin term paupiculos sacerdotes, which literally means little poor priest. But some translators have rendered this expression as sinful priests because Francis was clearly not speaking about economic poverty. There were many sinful priests in St. Francis' day. Clerical marriages, common law marriages, were a problem. Clerical greed and clerical careerism were other problems. The training of priests left much to be desired. Stephen of Bourbon was a Dominican friar who wrote a book for preachers, and this book contained many stories that they might find useful in their preaching. Here is one of them. Stephen writes, I have heard that one day Blessed Francis entered a certain village in Lombardy where the fame of his holiness preceded him. Now a certain heretic, knowing him to be a simple man, wanted to demonstrate the truth of his own sect and increase those who believed in it, for all the people had run out to meet Francis. Therefore, seeing that the priest of the village was also hurrying out to greet Francis, the heretic called out, Look, good man! What do you think about this fellow who has the care of this parish? He keeps a concubine, and it is clear to all of us that he is guilty of many sins. Can such a man administer or do anything which is not tainted? The saint, realizing the heretic's malice, said, Is this man here, the, the priest of this village about whom you are saying such things? When they said he is, Francis fell down on his knees in the dust, and kissing the priest's hands, said, These hands have touched my Lord. No matter what kind of hands they may be, they are not able to make him impure nor lessen his power. For the honor of the Lord I will honor his servant. For himself this man might be evil, but he is good for me. And at this the heretics were confounded. So notice that Francis does not try to minimize the priest's sin. And he said, for himself, this man might be evil. The suggestion is that he will answer to God. But on the question of his office and the celebration of the Eucharist in this local parish, Francis is ready to say that he would receive the Eucharist from such a priest. Francis' respect for priests is rooted in their role in making Christ physically present by means of the Eucharist. This belief was linked to Francis' appreciation for Jesus' incarnation. A later follower of St. Francis, Blessed John Scotus, a theologian, would describe Jesus' incarnation as God's greatest accomplishment. <laughs> 